Oh, I think it was fine. <laughs> yeah, it was fine. Which one?
You're alive. I've got no thing on alive yet. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. It's uh, great to see you're here. Uh, welcome to those who are new in particular. Uh, we're going to make a start. So the music team will be leading us in our first song in his name. So please stand.
Good morning all and welcome to church again and it's uh, so encouraging to see you all here and it's wonderful isn't it that we're able to meet and sing songs of praise to God together, pray in Christ uh, and also hear God's word uh, preached to us as well. Well, We've been uh, doing Isaiah and in uh, chapters uh, 1 to 35, um, to recap, it's a very much a prophetic number of chapters uh, with the overriding theme of uh, condemnation. Uh, Chapters uh, 40 to 66 is messianic, Uh, that is, there are lots of themes pertaining to to Christ, the Messiah, and the implications on mankind. Um, And the the overriding themes in this particular instance is comfort and consolation. And uh, Isaiah 40, verses 1 to 2 says this. Sorry. Should have brought that up in the first place. Um, Okay, verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your Lord. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And this is a stark contrast to uh, Isaiah chapter 3, whereby the Lord uh, judges Israel by withdrawing uh, supports and supplies, as you may recall, and just uh, allowing anarchy to perpetuate as part of his judgment. Um, and, And this is just a manifestation of their wickedness um, as their words and deeds were indeed against the Lord, and the Lord allowed this to happen. Well, today, there's, there's wonderful news along the themes of comfort and consolation. Uh, we'll be learning from Isaiah 42, and we'll be learning about the servant, uh, the fulfilment, um, 
of, of this servant uh, that's been talked about uh, in the New Testament um, has its origins in Isaiah 42. Um, and essentially, there will be restoration for Israel and the nations. Let me open a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. We thank you for your amazing love in sending your son, your servant, to take the punishment we deserve and to give us life in all its fullness. We thank you, Lord, that under your sovereignty you've bestowed upon us faithful leadership. We thank you for Tim and Omi and their involvement in church ministry here at St. Mark's. Uh, we thank you for Tim as he preaches and teaches us from Isaiah 42. We thank you for the, all the time and effort he's um, put into preparation of the sermon to teach God's word very clearly today. We pray that it'll be very bold and very challenging. And at the same time, Lord, we pray for each and every individual person here and also those on the live stream, that you'll give us ears to hear, soften our hearts so we can wrestle with your word and ultimately be obedient, growing in our Christian faith. Galvan us, us, Lord, to do so more and more. And we pray all these things in your precious son's name. Amen. I'm going to invite uh, Carol to lead us in the family spot. Good morning, church fam. Today, we're going to learn about a very special first from the Bible. In fact, we're not just going to learn about it, we're going to write it on our hearts. Um, now, that's kind of a funny phrase. Does anyone know what that means, to write God's word on our hearts? You can just put your hand up if you have any idea. No? No idea? <laughs> well, in the Bible, God says... We should write his words on the tablet or notebook of our heart. Basically, he wants us to know his words so well that we could say them without even having to look them up. Instead of just writing them on paper, he wants us to write it on our hearts so we have it everywhere we go. It's like when you're playing netball. You have to know the rules to the game, like where each position can go. You know, do you have to pull out a notebook when you're playing a game and memorise uh, and look up your notes? No way. You have to memorise it so that you know it without having to look it up. And sometimes we do this just for fun, like when we know a song and can sing it in the shower. The first we're looking at today is a piece of scripture I've memorised uh, for some time, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. And there's a song that goes with it. But before we get to the fun bit, let's actually look at it and see if we uh, understand what each line says. So trust in the Lord with all your heart. To put it simply, uh, trusting in God means believing what he says about himself, about the world and about you is true and unchangeable, that he keeps his promises. And trusting him with all our heart means we trust him all the time, in all situations and in all areas of our lives. Next line, lean not on your own understanding. Now, that's an interesting phrase to use. What do you think it means? So opening up to the floor again. Put your hands up if you know, have any idea what lean not on your own understanding? Yes. Yeah. Thanks, James. So he said, yeah, don't base it on human wisdom. Uh, now, where am I? Yeah, basically it means that we shouldn't just listen to our own ideas and make our own plans, because we just don't know everything like God does. The next part is, in all your ways, acknowledge him. Does someone want to tell me what you think that means? In all your ways, acknowledge him. I guess he's uh, revealed himself to us in creation, so it's, it's nice to be reminded that um, God has revealed himself to us to the whole mankind in creation. Uh, but, but to learn more and acknowledge That's a very good response. Yeah, awesome. Um, so yeah, recognize he, yeah, he is the God of our lives and we should give up our plans and let God lead us. So last, last line is pretty straightforward. Uh, pretty much if you let God lead you, he will clear the road for you to follow. Um, so now we can uh, 
to learn the song and sing the song together. There's um, some really fun dance moves that goes with it. <laughs> Could I get my helpers to come up? <laughs> Milan Amri. So everyone, get off your seats, stand up. And the lyrics, well, the words to the verse is slightly different in this version, uh, but it means the same thing as what we've just looked at. All right, hit it. Just in the light with all your heart Not depend on your own understanding Seek his will and all you do And he will show you which path to take Trust in the light with all your heart Not depend on your own understanding Seek his will and all you do And he will show you which path to take to the kids program. Wow, that was, that was amazing. And um, my question is, uh, why wasn't Josh Wong up there helping out? <laughs> oh, sorry. All right, okay, okay. Uh, all right so we're going to have uh, God's word read to us now. Uh, so Karen will be reading from um, Matthew 12, uh, followed by Claire, who will be doing their sermon reading, Isaiah 42. I'm actually reading, um, oh yeah, a different passage in Matthew. Do you want me to read this one? Um, I was going to read Matthew 12, 9 to... Would you prefer me to read that one or would you prefer me to read 13? Very flexible up here. Okay, I'll go Matthew 12. So listen carefully. Matthew 12, verse 9 to 21. Oh, yes, there we go. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with the shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, Will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out. And it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they may kill him. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. 
a large crowd followed him, and he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about him. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out, till he has brought justice through to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. This is the word of the Lord. Reading from Isaiah 42, um, verse 1 to 9. The servant of the Lord. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not cry, shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till, till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says, the, cre- the creator of the heaven who stretched them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or praise, or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, into being I announce them to you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Tim. I have the great privilege of speaking to us this morning from Isaiah chapter 42. Um, how about I'll pray for us and then we can look at God's word together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Uh, we pray that you would help us now to understand what it says and that your spirit would work in us uh, to transform us and to make us more like your son. Amen. Yesterday, Naomi and I had uh, the great privilege of participating in the grand tradition, enjoying a sausage sizzle on election day. Now, where we voted at Croydon Park Public School, uh, they had bacon and eggs and sausages and chai tea and cakes. It was quite a spread. And then down the road, there was gelato, so even better. So we enjoyed, we enjoyed that far more than anything else yesterday. Uh, but before we could enjoy the rich bountiful fare of food set before us, we had to vote. And the big question that we were faced with, that we were all faced with yesterday, is who is the best leader for our country? Maybe it's ScoMo, Albo, someone else with a cool nickname as well. Uh, But we're thinking about the different issues and problems or situations that we're faced with in Australia. And each of the parties uh, gave their take on things and offered their solution. And so we had to choose which one we think will solve those problems. And this morning, as we awoke to a new Prime Minister, uh, just because Anthony Albanese is elected doesn't necessarily mean that he is the one that has all the answers. Is there someone who can fix the problems of our world? And if so, who? Who is the leader that we ought to look for? Who do you think might fix the problems that we face. 
Now, in a very different part of the world to our own, in a very different time, the nation of Israel also faced many problems. Their nation had been ripped in two, and because of their sin, because of their rebellion against God continually, they'd been conquered and captured by a foreign nation and taken away into a different land, away from their God and away from their home. Yet God promised in Isaiah that he would make things right. He had someone in mind who would fix these problems. And that person is who we meet today in chapter 42. We meet the servant of the Lord. So we might go to the first slide. And then the next slide, slide point one. The servant of the Lord will quietly bring justice. Now we open chapter 42. So if you've got your Bibles there, it'd be very helpful to have that open so you can follow along. Uh, We open chapter 42, verse 1, with a change of pace from what has come immediately before it. No longer is God bringing judgment, as he has in chapter 41, against false gods or idols of the nations around them and the ones that Israel had been worshipping. But here in 42, verse 1, God turns our attention to someone worth paying attention to. He says, Here is my servant whom I uphold. My chosen one, in whom I delight. We're meant to sit up and pay attention. Who is this servant? What is he like? What is he going to do? Well, we're told that God's spirit in verse 1 is put on him to set him apart, to do his work, to bring justice to the nations. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to bring justice to the nations? We might have different uh, words that come to mind when we hear the word justice. Does it look like helping the poor or fighting crime, locking up the bad guys, taking from the rich and giving to the poor, dressing up in a spandex suit and naming yourself after an animal like a bat or a spider (laughs) or an iron, like Iron Man? What are we talking about when we talk about justice? Well, in particular, in Isaiah chapter 42 and sort of the broader sweep of Isaiah as a whole, justice is more than just a courtroom decision of punishing someone who's guilty. What's in mind, the big picture, is a cosmic reordering of what God's world was intended to be. Now, part of that reordering, as we would expect, involves punishing those who are guilty, like in the sense of justice we might think of. But it's bigger than just punishing individuals for wrongdoing. God's spirit-appointed servant reorients God's world to how it should be. Now, if in some strange turn of events, God asked you to be on the committee to look for his servant, what sort of person would you look for? Who is the ideal candidate Now, if you're thinking, okay, this person's bringing justice to the nations, reordering the world, how it should be, maybe they need a commanding presence. Maybe they should be able to speak powerfully and with charisma and enthusiasm, convincing people of what they need to do. He knows what people need to hear. He knows how he can get things done. Maybe someone who, having to go to the nations, maybe he has his own private plane, so he can just get anywhere he needs to go pretty quickly. Maybe he has friends in all the right places. He knows exactly who to talk to to get done what he needs to get done. We might have different ideas of who this ideal person, what they should be able to do. But surprisingly, if you have a look here in verses 1 to 4, this servant of the Lord doesn't tick any of those boxes. In fact, he's almost the opposite of what we might expect in someone who will reconfigure the world. Verse 2, he will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. The servant of the Lord will be quiet. He'll be gentle. He'll be faithful. He'll be humble. He won't cry out or raise his voice. He won't bring attention to himself. He won't even break a piece of grass or blow out a candle. Does that surprise you? Who is the type of person God has ordained and has chosen to bring order and justice to his world? 
It's someone who, as we might say today, wouldn't even hurt a fly. Isaiah here doesn't highlight the servant's impressive skills. It's not about what he brings to the table. What's on view is the servant's character. He's gentle, he's quiet, he trusts in his God. He's not violent or heavy-handed like the rulers of the other nations around Israel at the time, but he quietly, faithfully, gets on with his spirit-appointed business of righting wrong. Now, do you resonate with that particular way of thinking? Do you think about character over competencies, as we might say, about godliness over giftedness? What should we look for in our leadership? Particularly, what about Christian leadership, that in the church? Or, maybe not necessarily in leadership, but in ourselves as Christians? Whether we're in a leading role or a, in a te- heading up a team role, or just getting alongside and serving with one another? Do you focus first and foremost on what you're good at, and maybe showing other people what you're good at? Or is the highest priority your godliness, your humility. The Apostle Paul talks about a similar thing in, for example, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, He says, I'll just read it out for us, the overseer, so the person who has the office of overseeing the church, watching over, is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. There's other similar passages in 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus that all talk about the similar thing. But did you notice how many of those things in that list were not about what this person has to be good at, but rather the sort of person that they are? As God's people, godliness, our character, our maturity, should matter a whole lot more than what we might be good at. Now, some people are good at understanding a Bible passage or, you know, to prepare to preach a sermon or to lead a Bible study and leading other people in that, or perhaps playing and singing in the music team, in praying up the front, reading the Bible up the front, operating the audiovisual equipment, all sorts of different jobs and roles and tasks that might require someone to have certain skills. And all of those are really good things to be doing. They're really important. But looking at what God shows us about his servant someone who's quiet, humble, gentle, faithful. When we as God's people who are saved from sin and from death and we tick all the right boxes of getting all the right jobs done and having the right sort of qualities in being able to be up the front, doing jobs the right way, yet when we do those things but also live in a way contrary to God's deliberate pattern that he has given to us, when we live in a deliberate path of sin and selfishness and rebelliousness against God, we find ourselves at odds with God's mission through his servant. We find ourselves at odds with God himself. Now, leading a Bible study and helping people understand what the passage says, encouraging people to drink richly and deeply from the wonderful truths of the Bible, urging people to repentance, turning away from their sin, and to putting on the new self and trusting in Jesus is a wonderful thing. Teaching scripture in schools or kids' church or youth group, helping the next generation, as it were, of kids to understand God's beautiful, welcoming love in Jesus is a wonderful thing. Playing and singing really well in the music team, standing at the door and welcoming people into church to create a positive and welcoming culture at St. Mark's, all of those are good and wonderful things and really important things and things that need to be done. But if while doing those things and being involved in certain ministries, you yell at or abuse your wife or you mock your husband and belittle him, If you come home from Bible study each week and look at porn, if you deliberately put yourself in a situation where you're alone with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, easily prone to sin, 
if you're violent, if you're short-tempered, harsh, bringing people down with your words, if you look down on others who are different to yourself, if you judge them and gossip about them, even though they're your brother or sister, because Jesus has welcomed them and accepted them as he's accepted you, you are at odds with God. Even doing the right things, things that are necessary and important and really beneficial for people, but in secret or even in public, when your character does not align with that and you're living in rebellion against God, then something is terribly wrong. When our character is not lined up, we actually contribute to the disordering of the world that comes about by our sin. We are at odds with God's work in his servant, and we are at odds with God himself. In 2019 and 2020, a few years ago, uh, I was doing Christian ministry among university students at the University of Wollongong, and Naomi was doing that as well. Um, now, in my job, I had a number of different roles which were really helpful and beneficial in stretching and growing my own competencies, and I really enjoyed doing them as well. Sort of training in preaching, in leading Bible studies, doing walk-up evangelism, running and managing different ministry teams, all really good things, really important things, and good in my own training and in training other people as well. But I remember a couple of specific occasions where some of the more senior ministry staff who were sort of over me in, in that team had to pull me up on some things. They were, would very graciously and patiently have the hard word with me. In particular, I remember uh, a couple of times when uh, the way that I might speak to people or around people might have been careless uh, or hurtful, uh, and, I, and it was necessary and really hard for then someone who loved me to say, Tim, I think there's a problem here. Now, I'm not sure if you've experienced anything like that, but it's a very unpleasant thing being rebuked. No one likes that. But I'm very thankful, after the fact, for the dear brothers and sisters that loved me enough to have that hard word for my own sake and for my godliness, but also for the sake that I was serving alongside and then would continue to serve alongside. God lovingly shows us our own sin in his word, but also through brothers and sisters alongside us, not just for the sake of highlighting sin and bringing us shame, but so that we would turn from our sin, so that we would come to him as our loving and merciful father who so generously gives forgiveness for all of our sin for those who ask. And as we'll see, that work of forgiveness is actually what comes through the servant. Which brings us to our second point. The servant of the Lord will be a blessing to the whole world. Now, we've learned a little bit about the servant's role in the first few verses, but here in verses 5 to 9, for the, the second half, we see his missions kind of fleshed out a bit. He will bring justice to the nations, we've heard about that, by, verse 6, being a light. And verse 7, he will cause the blind to see. He will release prisoners from their darkness. And as we meet this servant in Isaiah 42, we're also brought face to face with his God, the Lord. Verse 6, have a look with me. This is God speaking now to his servant. He says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. I, the Lord, not the false gods of the other nations, not the dumb and blind and worthless idols and statues that you have foolishly turned to, Israel, but I, the Lord, who created the heavens and the earth, I will do this. It is God's work, ultimately, behind his servant. The Lord will make his servant to be, in verse 6, a covenant for the people. Now, a covenant is, at its mo most basic level, an agreement. But more than just an agreement, 
A covenant is the formal initiation of a relationship between two parties that does not occur naturally. For example, I entered into a covenant relationship on the 12th of January, 2019. That is when Naomi and I got married, which I know, covenant relationship is pretty romantic language. (laughs) Marriage is not a relationship that occurs naturally. You don't just suddenly appear to be married. But by contrast, for example, the relationship you have with your children or your siblings or your parents, a biological relationship, is natural. That's not a covenant relationship because you were born into it. So in verse 6, this servant will be a covenant because he's the connection point of the unnatural relationship because of our sin between God and the people the Gentiles, the nations, between God and the whole world. And this is particularly good news for us. Now, I'm making an assumption here that most of us are from the nations as opposed to being from Israel. You and I are Gentiles. We are, verse 7, blind because of our sin. We are separate from God. Now, in his letter to the Ephesians, Paul writes this up on the screen. He says something. It's a mystery. He says, writing to Gentiles, remember that you, sorry, that formerly, you who are Gentiles by birth at that time were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. Now, you and I were separate from God, the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. And in Isaiah 42, this servant is the solution to that problem. Which then begs the question, which maybe you have this question, who is this servant that Isaiah is talking about? Maybe it's Isaiah himself. After all, he wrote the book as the one that God chose to bring his message to Israel and to the nations. And in fact, in Isaiah chapter 20, God calls Isaiah, my servant. Or maybe in chapter 41, God calls Israel, his servant, his chosen one. So maybe the nation of Israel is God's servant on view here. However, as you read the Old Testament, it shows that, very sadly, Israel failed to serve God anything close to faithfully and perfectly as they should, as they agreed to, actually. And where the servant is described as quiet and faithful in chapter 42, at the end of this same chapter, Israel is described as blind and deaf and are actually said that they themselves are in prison and so therefore are unable to rescue others out of that prison. So who is the servant of the Lord? And that brings us to our third point, Today, the servant of the Lord brings light, even today. Now, to answer that question, who is the servant? Uh, There's a number of different parts of the Bible we could turn to. For example, Matthew chapter 12. Uh, But we're going to look at Luke chapter 3. So I'm going to read it out. If you want to turn there, you can as well. Uh, Luke chapter 3, verse 21. Now, in context, John the Baptist has been baptizing people, and then someone else rocks up onto the stage. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. The servant in whom God delights and puts his spirit on is the son whom the father loves and is pleased with and the Holy Spirit descends on. Now, maybe for many of us, that may come as no surprise that the servant of the Lord is Jesus. Jesus is portrayed as the ideal Israel, the one who doesn't raise his voice in the street, the one who doesn't bring attention to himself, the one who is not violent but gentle, not heavy-handed but compassionate, the perfect character model, the one who brings justice to the nations and reorients God's world his world, as intended. 
Jesus is the one who frees captives from the nations, from their prison of sin and death and darkness. But to just reinforce what we've been looking at, we're going to look at another verse now. So if you want to turn to Acts chapter 13, again, I'll read that out for us, or you can follow along. Acts chapter 13, verse 46 and 47. Uh, This is quite a crucial point in the narrative of Acts as the gospel is moving out now after Jesus has uh, ascended to heaven. And Paul and Barnabas have just brought the gospel to the Jews, but they have rejected it. And so this is what happens. Acts 13 verse 46. Paul and Barnabas answered the Jews boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles, to the nations. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles. Does that strike anyone as odd? I've made you a light for the Gentiles. Paul says, that's me. So who's the servant of the Lord? Not Jesus in this context, but Paul and Barnabas. Paul takes, he actually takes two different quotes from Isaiah and kind of mushes them together. But the first line is from Isaiah 42. The servant of the Lord, who will be a light to the Gentiles... Paul says, oh yeah, that's us, that's me. Didn't he go to Sunday school? Wasn't Paul a Sydney Anglican? Did he not know his biblical theology? Didn't he learn that everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus? Now certainly the servant of the Lord is ultimately fulfilled in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus. But Paul's making a very interesting point here. He says himself and Barnabas, as apostles of Jesus, continue, they carry on Jesus' mission of bringing sight and life and light to those in darkness, to the nations. Now, we see that mission begin and fulfilled, in one sense, in the Gospels, in Jesus' miracles and signs, in his teaching, but especially in his death and resurrection. But then after that, Paul and Barnabas, the other apostles, take the Gospel to the nations. Now, you and I are not apostles. I'm not Paul You're not Barnabas, probably. So we have to be careful not to draw a straight line directly from Paul to me. But there is a sense in which we, as people who know and trust Jesus, take on his mission to bring the gospel to the world. Since we have heard the gospel, we've heard this world-orienting news of Jesus, and we've believed it, we have a part to play in the mission of Jesus, the servant of the Lord. But what is that part to play? Well, first of all, the first part is to believe the gospel about Jesus, the Son of God. So if you don't believe it, that's something you should do. And secondly, once you're on board with Jesus' mission, yep, let's go. Be involved in taking Jesus' news this message, his mission, out to the world. After all, you and I are the nations. We're the Gentiles. There are billions of people who don't know that Jesus is the rightful ruler of the world and will one day soon come back to judge and finally make everything right as God's servant. They are, these people... As Isaiah 42 says, as God says, blind, captive in prison, in dungeons, in darkness. As Ephesians 2 says that we looked at earlier, without hope. Now, not having hope doesn't mean that they might have a bad life. They might have a great life. But without hearing the name of Jesus and believing in him, there is no hope of escaping eternity in hell. Just as it was for you and I before someone told us the gospel and Jesus rescued us from our prison and from our darkness. 
And so then how can we practically be involved in the servant's mission? Well, I'll give two ways that we can do that. First of all, pray. Now, I know you're thinking, oh, just prayer, that doesn't mean anything. It's not real application. But pray about it. Last week, we had Simon and Alison Roberts come and visit and share about their ministry in Western Australia. We've had Peter and Terry Blouse come and share about their work in Argentina. Joining them on the back wall, we've got Andrew and Abby Buchanan in Indonesia and the Driscolls at uni in Canberra. And I'm sure that you guys know many more people who are taking the gospel to the nations or Australia. It's a pretty big country. So pray for them. God is at work and God uses our prayers to achieve his goal of gathering people around Jesus, just like we are right now. So pray that God would save his people. Pray specifically and deliberately for those who have gone to Australia greater Australia to overseas, all those who are preparing to go, and pray that God would raise up more people to do that as well. So, pray. Secondly, go. Consider how or where or when you could go somewhere else and tell others who have not heard about Jesus. Now, for many of you, that may not be feasible because of health or family or whatever other issues there might be. So maybe your take home this morning is thinking about your relationships and weekly patterns that you have now and using them for the sake of the gospel so you're not off the hook. But for others, would you consider going somewhere outside of Malabar, outside of Sydney, outside of Australia for the sake of the gospel. Maybe your job is one that you can do from home, and so home could really kind of be anywhere. Maybe your job is one that you can take on the road to somewhere and work where people don't have the gospel and live there and work there as a Christian, being a light for the Gentiles. Maybe you could move to Western Australia with the Roberts, support them by just being in their church or in the countless other churches that I'm sure are in the same position as that in Exmouth. Could you pray that your children would grow up to go? That they would leave the security and safety of Sydney, which is nothing really secure or safe about it, to go somewhere far away for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of those who otherwise will never hear about Jesus? Maybe you might consider leaving your job completely and pursuing theological training and study so that you might go overseas for the long haul. What does the servant's mission look like for you in your particular circumstance? Now, as we finish our time together this morning, uh, thinking about the servant's mission, thinking about who the servant is, thinking about our role in his mission, whatever that might look like, we're going to look at one last part of the Bible together. So if you turn to Philippians chapter 2, and we'll close with this. It's a pretty well-known part of the Bible. You might be familiar with it. Uh, But as this morning we've considered our own character, we've considered how we relate to each other, as we consider Jesus, the servant of the Lord, And we think about how we can take Jesus' mission to the whole world so that everyone hears the gospel and believes. You might find that there's a number of threads that come together in Philippians chapter 2. And I wonder if Paul kind of had this in mind as he wrote this. So I'll read Philippians 2 from verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who... Being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, 
and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the good news of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that he has saved us, though we were far away from you, and we pray that you would help us to be involved rightly in his mission to save people. Amen. The servant brings justice, the servant blesses the whole world, and the servant brings light even today. Uh, No other name can save but Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, Please stand as we sing our next song together, No Other Name, and uh, Kelvin will be praying thereafter.
Let's bow our head and pray. Father Lord, we pray for our children ministries on Sunday. Give thanks for all the devoted teachers and leaders. Naomi, Tim, Hannah, Sarah, Lauren, Sophie, and Cashlyn. Pray that they will be faithful to teach our children to follow your way and set good models for them so that they may share in your holiness. Pray that you will bless each of the classes, preschool, K-2, Cup 35, and Switch, and help each of the kids to grow strong in knowledge. Keep your words in their heart and share the good news with their peers. Pray that they will be fully equipped and refined to be one of your spiritual soldiers when they grow up. Pray that our children's ministry will be fruitful with more children joining and settling into our Sunday school. Pray to not that you will continue to open ways for St. Mark's in your name to serve the local community here. As more people making Malabar, Little Bays and the surrounding suburbs home, pray that they will be able to support the spiritual need of the locals through our networks in schools, aged cares and other channels. Pray that more people will be raised to have us to feel and the people in this community will open their hearts and accept you once the good news being reached out to them. And St. Mark will achieve its assigned missions of making Christ known. Heavenly Fathers, I give thanks for having our democratic governments and pray for all men and women who are having authority over us in the country. Pour out your spirit upon them, make your words known to them, and let your wisdom enter their hearts so that they are doing what is right in your sign. We specially pray for our federal elections. Pray that the elections process is just and fair, and the future leaders who are elected to be godly, willing to walk in righteousness, and protecting us as peoples of faith against religious discriminations. Pray for all the public servants to serve the country with all their hearts, taking Jesus as the example and putting the community interests as the top priorities. And pray that they will carry out their duties and government policies effectively. Pray for the emergency services team to be safe and wisdom from you whenever and wherever they help to assist people in times of disasters, especially over the flood areas in Queensland and Northern New South Wales. For the Lord, we also pray for the work of Bush Church Aid Society. Help us to remember those who live in isolated and remote parts of our land. We ask you to strengthen and encourage all whose ministries are supported by the Bush Church Age Society, including Simon and Anderson Roberts. Refresh them in times of discouragement and loneliness and call others to stand with them in the task of making Christ known over the vast land in the remote area. Grant that the, through the ministry of the word and caring services, the message of your redeeming love may be proclaimed and accepted by the peoples of our land. We also pray for Angel Bikilins and his family, Abby and Tim, who are the CMS missionaries in Turanja, Indonesia. Give thanks that Angels can finally get the visa, which will enable him to return to Turanja after the lady four years. By God's will, pray that their, pl their flies will be living at pl as planned and bring them back safely to Roranja by the end of this month. We also pray for a quick recovery from COVID for Abby and Tim before the departures. Pray for the free master's students who can finish their thesis under Andrew's supervision by the beginning of June. And give thanks for many in the Toronto churches who have a wish to see congregation growing in faith and love. Heavenly Fathers, give thanks that you have sent Jesus to this world to die for us so that we are no longer living under the bondage of sin. We love because you first love us. May God give us wisdom and trust so that we have full confidence on our belief to speak of the Lord Jesus and demonstrate his love in practical actions to help others to grow spiritually. And pray that we are willing to put ourselves down and love and care our labors as what Jesus commands us to do in these last days of the world. Lastly, we pray for those unriched groups who currently have no access to the gospel due to their removeness or under persecution from the government. Pray that you will have mercy on them by sending missionaries to spread out the good news. Pray that through witnessing the God's creation in this world and through reading your words, 
they will acknowledge you, repent, and put their face upon you when the good news reaching them. Pray Holy Spirit will help them to understand your great salvation plan and keep walking in God's way. We pray all this in your precious Son's name. Amen. All right, we're going to say the uh, Apostles' Creed together uh, to affirm our Christian faith. Please join me. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Christ Jesus, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Um, all right, so an announcement is that uh, uh, for the women of the congregation, uh, Equip is on, uh, so Carol Wong is coordinating that, uh, so please reserve uh, Saturday 18th of June uh, 2022, and it'll be on the, the Book of Lamentations. All right, so we've learnt uh, a lot today, uh, so thank you, Tim, for preaching such a, a faithful, such a loaded uh, sermon with uh, lots of practical implications. We've learned about the servant bringing justice, um, the servant blessing the whole world, um, and the servant bringing light even to today. So um, as Tim mentioned, uh, most of you would be Gentiles, uh, and so we've been grafted into God's family uh, through what Jesus Christ has done. And, and that's amazing, isn't it? This is um, a little bit different from uh, chapter 40, where it just talks about restoration of Israel. Now, this entails and encapsulates the, the nations as well. Um, so I'm going to pray before we sing our last song together. Our last song is going to be Christ, Our Hope in Life and Death. And we, yeah, we thank you dear, for Jesus in that he, he brings light even to today. Uh, so I'm, I'm now 44. This is my, my throwaway line. You know, I've, I've passed the halfway mark. <laughs> so I remember going to the you know, 21st birthday parties, weddings, uh, going to um, baby showers, etc. Uh, now Angela and I are going to funerals, unfortunately. So it's, um, it's, yeah, it's amazing we have this light. So let's, um, let's sing our last song together. Let's stand to sing. Let our souls to 
Please be seated. Okay, that concludes the uh, formal meeting. Um, see you on morning tea. Thank you.